oral questions. Test zones are out. The Honorable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, a federal court judge ruled that the Agriculture Minister and the Conservative Government has broken the law. They breached the Canadian Wheat Board Act by making changes without holding a referendum among producers first. Yes, in light of this development, will the government do the right thing and back off the Wheat Board? Honourable Minister of Human Resources. Well, Mr. Speaker, we were as disappointed as Western farmers with the decision that was brought down today. Mr. Speaker, we will be appealing that decision because, quite frankly, we believe in marketing freedom for Canadian farmers, unlike the NDP, who want to legalize marijuana and the sale of marijuana, but criminalize the sale of Western barley. Leader of the Opposition. I have to say we're quite far from the wheat board. <laughs> the Prime Minister is in Washington today to sign a new border agreement with the United States. I guess Canadian politicians can go to Washington after all, eh? Very little information has filtered from this secret negotiation. Canadians have had almost no input. The government won't even say what they have been negotiating away behind closed doors. Can the government confirm that the cost of the new, the new border deal will be a billion dollars? The Honourable Minister of Human Resources. Well, Mr. Speaker, I think the contrast is rather striking. When the NDP members of Parliament go to Washington, it's to lobby against Canadian jobs, it's to lobby against Canadian exports, and it's to lobby against Shame. private sector unionized, unionized workplaces and workers. Mr. Speaker, by contrast, when our Prime Minister goes to Washington, it's to lobby to create Canadian jobs, here, here. to create opportunities for Canadian business. Les Canadiens sont inquiets avec raison. Ils veulent savoir jusqu'à quel point l'oncle Sam pourra venir fouiller dans leurs affaires à cause de cette entente. On ignore toujours quels renseignements sont visés. C'est un secret que le gouvernement refuse de révéler. Le gouvernement peut-il préciser quels renseignements seront transmis aux Américains? Est-ce que les conservateurs vont mettre en place les recommandations de la commissaire à la vie privée pour renforcer la protection des renseignements personnels des gens? Monsieur le Président, nous garderons bien sûr les intérêts des Canadiens. Ça, c'est notre sécurité. Mais la chose la plus importante, c'est que nous allons créer des emplois. Nous allons créer des opportunités pour notre, nos entreprises parce que c'est notre priorité. Mr. Speaker, our jobs, our border communities and our privacy are at stake. Canadians need to know that this deal will get results. We've seen it before. This government sits down with the Americans and we end up with a thicker, slower and more costly border. Airport taxes, airport delays, border delays and the lowest level of Canadian exports to the U.S. since 1982. Mm. How do the, we know this actual deal will increase the, uh, the this trade between Canada and the United States? What facts can they table today that it's actually going to get results for Canadians? Great point. The Honourable Minister of International Trade. Well, Mr. Speaker, I would invite the member to await the outcome of these negotiations. Uh, and I will also remind him that Trade is absolutely critical to Canada's national prosperity. Trade is critical to driving economic growth. Now, I want to remind the member that over the years, the NDP has consistently opposed trade with the United States and with every other country around the world. They've opposed every single free trade agreement this country has ever signed. This Conservative government stands up for Canadians and focuses on the economy and on creating jobs. The member for Windsor West. Every single trade deal that this government has signed has actually cost Canadian jobs. That's why we're opposed. Platitudes are not enough. Canadians who rely on cross-border trade need assurances that this deal is actually going to reduce border wait times. Mr. Speaker, the Detroit-Windsor crossing is really nearly half of a Canada's trade with the United States takes place every single day. We cannot afford to leave our communities waiting. Does this government have any facts to back up their estimates of reduced border wait times? Will they take, tell Canadians? Why won't this minister stand up for Canadians in Washington like New Democrats do? The Honourable Minister 
Honourable Minister of International Trade. Well, Mr. Speaker, clearly the member and the NDP still don't get it. The Canada-U.S. trade relationship is an example of how partners can benefit from opening their borders to trade. It's the world's greatest free trade success story. One in five Canadian jobs is dependent on trade, and that's why we're ensuring enhanced access to the United States, our largest and most important trading partner. It's shameful that the NDP sends MPs to Washington not to promote our great country, but to shut down Canadian exports and shut down Canadian jobs. Yeah. Member for Toronto Centre. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. In light of the judge's decision in Manitoba with respect to the Wheat Board, uh, in which uh, it, it states clearly the minister should, will be held accountable for his disregard for the rule of law. I wonder if the government can give us at least this assurance that the legislation will not be proceeded with as long as this matter is in front of the courts and as long as this judgment stands. Dear Mr. Speaker. Dear. The Honourable Minister of Human Resources. We are disappointed in the ruling that came down today, or as disappointed as Western farmers are that they're not going to be able to right away get the freedom to market their products as, as growers in Eastern Canada get to do. We will be appealing this decision, and of course, Mr. Speaker, we will abide by the laws. Member for Toronto Centre. Abide by the laws. Not quite sure. We'll have to see what that means, uh, Mr. Speaker. The legislation is now in front of Parliament. Yeah. I want to have a categorical assurance from the minister, a categorical assurance that she will simply say that the legislation will not be proceeded with as long as this matter is in front of the courts and as long as we have a judgment that says that the minister, who's now chatting with the minister, that the minister of agriculture has had a disregard for the rule of law in the way in which he's tried to implement this legislation. Can we at least have that assurance from the minister? The Honourable Minister of Human Resources. I made it very clear that we disagree with the ruling, and that's why we're going to be appealing it on behalf of Canadian farmers. Anyway. Well, member for Toronto Centre. I haven't had an answer to the question, but I'd like to ask another question to the government with respect to the events in Attawapiskat. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the Indian Act is a, a, a colonial relic. It's been in place for uh, decades. Uh, it gives extraordinary powers to the minister and to the crown with respect to the uh, to uh, people who are described in the act as Indians. Uh, it stretches all the way from wills to the care of children to defining this and that. It is an absolutely anachronistic piece of legislation. I'd like to ask the government, are they or are they not going to have the courage to put the question of the future of the Indian Act firmly in discussions and negotiations that are supposed to take place in January, Mr. Speaker? The Honourable Minister of Human Resources. Well, Mr. Speaker, that's January. Right now, we're focusing on Attawapiskat. We're not trying to score cheap political points, as the Liberals are. In fact, we've been working round the clock to develop a plan that will ensure that uh, the residents there, children in particular, have a warm, dry place to sleep. The Minister of Aboriginal Affairs will be presenting that plan this afternoon. We do encourage the Band Council to work with us on this. They need to be part of the solution. Monsieur le Président, le ministre de la Défense a refusé de prendre ses responsabilités. Il refuse de s'excuser ou de démissionner. Tout ce qu'il fait, c'est inventer de nouvelles histoires. Va-t-il au moins répondre aux questions que les Canadiens se posent, alors qu'on sait qu'il a utilisé les services de recherche et sauvetage à plusieurs reprises? Va-t-il nous dire combien cette petite expédition en hélicoptère-taxi a coûté aux contribuables à qui on demande de se serrer la ceinture? Madame la ministre associée de la Défense. Mr. Speaker, one more time, as has been said many times before, the minister was called back from personal vacation to go to work, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Member for Beaches, East York. Mr. Speaker, it's too bad we didn't hear from the minister himself. I guess he's been airlifted to safety again. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, Colonel Plowman was pretty clear. Using search and rescue resources to get airlifted from a vacation was not about helping the Canadian forces. Now, as for his decision to hop in a basket to get to London for a press conference on a new military contract, a couple of questions. When exactly was this contract signed? When was the minister told? And when did he decide to travel to London? The Associate Minister of Defence. Mr. Speaker, let me repeat one more time. As has been said many times before, 
The minister was called back from personal vacation to go to work, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. We have a different order. The Honourable Member for the Dwayne Sudan. Mr. Speaker, when asked yesterday about recordings that mentioned strong arming, intimidation, and financial kickbacks for political appointments for the Port of Montreal, the Minister of Transport said the person was not appointed. End of story. So by this logic, does the minister believe that a robber who tries to hold up a bank but fails has committed a crime? No crime? If Conservative insiders were plotting to install someone as head of the Port Authority, why would ministers say nothing wrong happened just because they failed? The Honourable Minister of Transport. Mr. Speaker, the Chair of the Port of Montreal is appointed by the Board of Directors. The Board of Directors' name a man who wasn't the guy, Mr. Abdallah, they said before. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Okay. Le Premier ministre évite de répondre au scandale des nominations politiques en disant que c'est le conseil d'administration qui a pris la décision. Le problème, c'est que l'ancien directeur des communications du Premier ministre, Dimitri Soudas, a lui-même reconnu qu'il avait signalé la préférence du gouvernement pour M. Abdallah pour le port de Montréal. Les Canadiens ont le droit de savoir quel rôle a joué le gouvernement dans les nominations au port de Montréal. Quand le Premier ministre va-t-il répondre? Le ministre des Transports. Le Président, le Conseil d'administration du port de Montréal nomme le Président du port de Montréal. À l'époque, c'était un monsieur. Présentement, c'est une dame. Et le M. Abdallah, dont on a fait référence et on a nommé son nom dans le passé, n'a pas été nommé président du Conseil d'administration, M. le Président. Le Conseil d'administration a assumé ses responsabilités et fait ses choix, M. le Président. M. le Président, encore une belle façon d'éviter de répondre aux questions. Uh, Mr. Speaker, conservatives deal with their many scandals by denying the facts and hoping, hoping everyone will just forget. For example, the President of the Treasury Board testified at a committee that the G8 pork project was removed at the request of the municipality. But we have evidence this is simply not true. It was the Muskoka minister himself who had the project removed from the list. Can you explain why he came to this committee and then misrepresented such a basic fact? <laughs> President of the Treasury Board. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I'd like to inform this House this is uh, week two now where the Honourable Member for Timmins James Bay has not apologized to me after being ruled by the Speaker to have absolutely no facts for his accusations when it, when it came to the accusation that I doctored Hansen, Mr. Speaker. So, in answer to the question, however, the Honourable Member should know that uh, he's mixing up the facts yet again. The facts uh, are that all, uh, all of those documents were provided to the Auditor General, and I answered all questions at the committee. <laughs> Le Président, ce n'est pas parce que le ministre porte une jolie cravate du temps des Fêtes que ça l'autorisait à jouer au Père Noël dans son comté avec 50 millions d'argent des contribuables. Le ministre a dit que c'était la ville, que c'était la ville qui avait décidé de retirer le projet. La même ville a envoyé deux courriels dans lesquels c'est indiqué que c'est le ministre qui a conseillé de retirer le projet. Voici les faits, Monsieur le Président. Pourquoi le président du Conseil du Trésor est venu témoigner en comité si c'était pour dire des choses qu'il savait fausses? Monsieur le Président, il a perdu toute crédibilité. Il n'a plus l'autorité morale de faire des compressions de 4 milliards dans nos services publics. Comment les Canadiens peuvent-ils encore lui faire confiance? Madame le Président du Conseil du Trésor. Speaker, the Honourable Member is once again mixing up facts, uh, just as they did at committee. I answered uh, questions uh, for two hours at committee. In fact, I answered 75 questions in total at uh, two committee hearings. Uh, this uh, matter, along with GHG20, has been at committee for 41 hours, Mr. Speaker. The Government, uh, government of Canada has complied with all, all questions, has delivered all documents. Uh, they're making uh, mountains out of molehills, just as they did at the very beginning of this exercise. Member for Timmins, James Bay. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, temperatures are continuing to drop in Attawapiskat, and I'm receiving messages from people who say there's a need for clean water, uh, baby supplies, and heating for the people in the tents. Now, we have Red Cross on the ground, and provincial emergency teams are on the ground. 
Uh, moving supplies up the coast, however, it will create a major logistical effort, and sending in a bean counter just won't cut it. The community has asked for the help of Canada's military to help coordinate supplies to get them up the coast. Will the government accept this request so that the people of Attawapiskat may yet have a Merry Christmas? Here, here. Well, Minister of Aboriginal Affairs. Speaker, unlike the NDP, we are focused on the residents of Attawapiskat and not on scoring political points. We've been working around the clock on a plan to ensure residents, especially children, have warm, dry places to sleep. We have a plan, Mr. Speaker. We're still committed to working with the Band Council, and we urge them to be part of the solution going forward. Member for Edmonton, Strathcona. Mr. Speaker, sending an accountant to deal with a humanitarian crisis is a sad testament to this minister's inability to respond to emergencies. Here, here. Yeah. Far too many First Nation communities are on the brink of crisis. In addition to the daily struggle of providing basic services that most of us take for granted, many are left stranded in the wake of spills and floods. When will the minister finally deliver a credible emergency response plan that ensures no First Nations are left abandoned in a moment of crisis? Yes. The Honourable Minister of Aboriginal Affairs. Mr. Speaker, uh, First Nation communities develop emergency management plans. We have two Cree communities in uh, Quebec that, had, that invoked their emergency management plan two days ago. They have taken care of their people. We were in constant contact. We're monitoring the situation. They don't need our help because, Mr. Speaker, the leadership of those communities is looking after their people and doing the right things. Monsieur le Président, la situation d'urgence à trois est loin d'être un cas isolé. C'est celle de centaines d'autres communautés autochtones du pays. 80% des réserves au Canada sont en prise avec un problème d'eau potable. Au Québec, le corps des communautés sont étouffés financièrement et s'enfoncent dans la pauvreté. Ce gouvernement a tourné le dos aux Autochtones. Monsieur le Président, faudra-t-il l'intervention des Nations Unies pour qu'on s'intéresse à eux? Mr. Speaker, our government is working with willing partners to improve the quality of life for Aboriginal people. We've made significant targeted investments in First Nation priorities like education, water and housing. We build over 2,000 homes and 3,000 renovations every year on reserves. We continue to work in collaboration with First Nations at the community, regional and national level to these ends. We'll continue to invest in practical, innovative solutions rather than the negativity coming from the other side, Mr. Speaker. Full member for Random here in St. George's. Mr. Speaker, the search and rescue taxi ride story keeps changing. First, we're told it was a pre planned demo for the minister. Not true. Then, we're told it's the only way to get the minister out of a private fishing camp to a government announcement. Again, not true. Today they claim it was a slide-in to existing Cormorant training, but the emails are crystal clear. The minister demanded a helicopter rather than take a boat. Why won't the minister admit the truth and apologize to this House and to Canadians? The Honourable Associate Minister of Defence. Well, Mr. Speaker, one more time. As has been said many times, the minister was called back from a personal vacation to go to work. And that's the bottom line, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Well, member for Cape Breton, Cancel. Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Human Resources wrongfully stated that 80% of EI applicants received their first check in 23 days. She knows full well that part of the indicator she referred to also included the issuance of a notice of non-payment. My question is simple. Once an application has been flagged for something as innocent as a typo or a small mistake, and a notice of non-payment is issued, is the clock reset on this application once the typo was fixed and resubmitted? Does the time on the services standard indicator, does it start all over again from day one? Good question. The Honourable Minister of Human Resources. Well, Mr. Speaker, as I explained to the Honourable Member at Committee and as did officials, the basic statistics do include the 
people who are deemed ineligible. But we are working to improve our, our service to Canadians. That's our goal. That's why we are working on automating the behind-the-scenes processing of EI so that we can deliver the checks to people, deliver the payments that they deserve and need as quickly as possible. Member for Cape Breton, Kansas. Mr. Speaker, the truth about committee is that she didn't know, and it had to be one of her officials that bailed her out, exactly. because she doesn't know the files and she doesn't know what's going on in her department. I've got a friend, Gordy Sampson, and he won an, a, a Grammy for writing a song, Jesus Take the Wheel. In the absence of divine intervention, and with this minister driving her department over the cliff, would somebody on that bench show so, some courage, some compassion, and help this minister through this Take mess? She's making a mess of Service Canada and hurting Canadians. Order the Honourable Minister of Human Resources. Well, Mr. Speaker, you know, we have, throughout the recession, we delivered the payments, EI payments to Canadians in a very timely manner. I wish the Honourable Member had noted that part. We are struggling right now with some challenges. It's a seasonal thing that we go through every year. We are putting additional resources to it. But, Mr. Speaker, what's a real shame is that even during the Economic Action Plan, when we wanted to put extra funding to help speed up payments for Canadians, the Liberals voted against that help for Canadians. Honourable Member for Burnaby, New Westminster. 19 000 emplois perdus le mois dernier, près de la moitié dans le secteur manufacturier. Un autre triste bilan pour ce gouvernement qui se trouve déjà avec le pire déficit commercial de notre histoire. I'm getting indications that the translation may not have been working. I'll allow the Honourable Member for Burnaby, New Westminster to restart his question. On a perdu 19 000 emplois le mois dernier, et près de la moitié dans, était dans le secteur manufacturier. Et ça, c'est un autre triste bilan pour ce gouvernement. Il se trouve déjà avec le pire déficit commercial de notre histoire, le pire niveau de dette familiale de notre histoire, et maintenant le pire dossier sur l'emploi manufacturier de notre histoire en tant que pays. L'emploi dans ce secteur est à son plus bas niveau depuis qu'on tienne des statistiques là-dessus, Monsieur le Président. Alors, pourquoi est-ce que le gouvernement n'est il ne s'agit pas pour protéger le, ce secteur et quel est le plan de ce gouvernement pour aider les travailleurs et les travailleuses qui ont perdu leur emploi à cause des politiques de ce gouvernement. Mr. Speaker, our government is, is focused on jobs and economic growth. We have the best job creation record in the, in the G7 since the end of the recession in July 2009. <coughs> the international organizations that look at these things are convinced that Canada again will we'll continue to lead in job creation, including the OECD, which just said in its outlook for, for 2011, Canada's long-term unemployment is among the lowest in the OECD, suggesting that job prospects have remained fairly positive for the unemployed even during the crisis. I'm sure if the member opposite actually cared about jobs, he and his party would not have voted against the job credit for small businesses to create jobs. The Honourable Member for Burnaby, New Westminster. It's hard thing to say. It's positive to lose jobs. Mr. Speaker, they lost 19,000 jobs last month. Those jobs are gone. 72,000 full-time jobs in the month of October. Gone. Mills and factories that support families across this country. Gone. They've lost high-paying jobs that are the bedrock of our communities. Manufacturing jobs are now at their lowest levels since records started getting keep in 1976. They're even worse than the Liberals, Mr. Speaker. So why doesn't the government have a real jobs plan? Why is it asleep at the wheel? And why don't they care about losing... Order. The Honourable Minister of Finance. Talks, but doesn't vote. You know, when we bring in measures that encourage job creation in this country, the accelerated capital cost allowance, the tax credit for small businesses, 525. They stand in their places, Mr. Speaker, and they vote against every one of this measure. But this member Shut has the, the nerve to stand up in the House and say that job creation is inadequate when he votes against every measure that would create jobs in the country. Le coup près est tombé sur la machine à papier numéro 6 et 7 des produits forestiers résolus à Canogami. À l'approche des fêtes, 400 travailleurs se retrouvent sans travail. Ils ne savent même pas s'ils retrouveront leur emploi après la fermeture temporaire de l'usine après les fêtes. 
avec des délais de traitement des demandes d'assurance emploi qui sont déjà trop longs. Qu'est-ce que le gouvernement a à dire à sa famille et qu'est-ce qu'il va attendre faire pour les aider? Madame le ministre des Ressources humaines. Ah, monsieur le Président, je tiens à cœur les, les euh, sentiments des gens qui ont perdu leur, leur emploi, surtout à, à ce temps de l'année. Mais je veux vous assurer que le Service Canada va travailler avec les provinces pour offrir à ces gens toutes, toutes, toutes les prestations et opportunités qui existent pour les aider. The Honourable Member for St. John South Mount Pearl. Mr. Speaker, it seems that under this government's watch, ACOA has been throwing money away. It gave a million dollar loan to Ocean Choice International to process yellowtail flounder in Newfoundland and Labrador. But at the same time, that company inked a deal the same to, to send the same fish to China for process, processing. Mr. Speaker, why would ACOA approve a loan to a company that creates fish processing jobs in China? Why isn't the funding why isn't it funding those jobs here at home? Oui, bravo. Mr. Speaker, I'm, I'm trying to follow the, the logic in the question, and I expect maybe maybe the honourable member will have a have a rebuttal, but I think he's actually talking about the loss of, of uh, fish plant jobs in the Marystown plant. And and certainly certainly if that is, Mr. Speaker, what he's discussing, have to understand that ACOA is, is here in Atlantic Canada to help entrepreneurs, to help manufacturers. Order. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary has the floor and I'll ask members to let him finish his response. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. ACOA does due diligence, Mr. Speaker, on every loan that they, that they give out. Uh, and we've worked closely with, uh, with Ocean Choice in Newfoundland. We'll continue to work closely with all manufacturers in Atlantic Canada. The Honourable Member for Mississauga East Cooksville. Mr. Speaker, Canadians were shocked and disappointed yesterday to see violent protests in Toronto, Ottawa, over the recent election in Democratic Republic of the Congo. Freedom of speech is a fundamental right in Canada. However, armed demonstrators and violence should not be tolerated. Can the Minister of International Cooperation please update the House on Canada's role in monitoring that the Congolese election was conducted in a fair manner? And the Honourable Minister of International Cooperation. Uh, Mr. Speaker, Canada is very proud to have sent the largest election observation delegation allowable as part of the EU observation mission to the Democratic Republic of the Congo. We continue to promote peace and democracy in the DRC and we urge all sides in the DRC and here in Canada to remain calm and to let the democratic process unfold. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Winnipeg Centre. During the federal election, the Minister of Agriculture promised prairie farmers they'd get a chance to vote on the future of the Canadian Wheat Board. We now know, Mr. Speaker, that uh, they not only broke their promise to farmers, the courts say they broke the law. Hey. Now, they punted the member for Edmonton East out of their caucus for, for failing to blow a breathalyzer test. What is the big law and order party going to do to a minister who flagrantly breaks the law? They should send him to the showers. <laughs> The Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Well, Mr. Speaker, we're all waiting with bated breath to see how that anger management course turned out, and apparently it didn't work. <laughs> let, me, let me quote the member from just a few short weeks ago. Parliament has the right to overturn legislation put in place by previous governments. We absolutely agree with the member from Winnipeg Centre when he said that, Mr. Speaker. And on behalf of Western Canadian farmers, we'll continue to finalize Bill C-18 and give them marketing freedom. We will also continue to appeal the declaration of the court today. Monsieur le Président, la performance du Canada en matière de lutte au changement climatique est si mauvaise que nous nous retrouvons derrière le Brésil, la Russie, l'Inde et la Chine. Le pire dans tout ça, c'est que les conservateurs ont déjà blâmé tous ces pays pour leur inaction. Est-ce que ce gouvernement réalise que pour participer à la nouvelle économie de l'énergie, il faut agir maintenant? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of the Environment. Well, Mr. Speaker, let's look at the NDP's playbook on international relations, the energy sector, and the environment. 
First, they lobby against Canadian jobs in the energy sector. Second, they vote against climate change budgetary measures. Third, they tell the international community to ignore our country. Fourth, they revel in awards that denigrate our country. Mr. Speaker, we have a plan that will ensure that all major emitters come to the table in an international agreement and a regular sector-by-sector -sector regulatory approach, a plan that's working, a plan that makes sense. Mr. Speaker, while the rest of the world is in Durban trying to make progress on these negotiations, Canada is telling the world that we're not interested. Because instead of making Canada a world leader in energy, in clean energy, they are first, giving away billions in tax breaks to fossil fuel companies, second, breaking their promise to regulate the oil sand emissions, and third, cutting funding for renewable energy. So why is this government isolating Canada, and why are they shutting us out of the green economy of the future? The Honourable Parliament Secretary for the Minister of the Environment. Well, Mr. Speaker, I'm not sure what my colleague opposite would call an economy that is a world leader in exporting intellectual property related to clean energy technology, as well as an energy sector that invests billions of dollars that has seen tangible uh, reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. This is Canada. This is working. Her party votes against budgetary measures to continue R&D in this area. Our, and our electricity sector produces 75% um, of our electricity from uh, non-emitting GHG sources. Be proud of our country. Be proud of our environmental plan. It turns out this government's story on firearms tracking isn't quite true. En fait, le gouvernement joue avec le feu. The RCMP Commissioner of Firearms confirmed yesterday that firearms dealers and stores will no longer be required to record information on gun sales. L'obligation pour les vendeurs d'armes de garder un registre des transactions, ben c'est terminé. Thanks to this government, police have lost their last tool to track firearms used in violent crimes. But that's not what this government wanted us to believe. Either the government doesn't understand its own bill, or the RCMP has it wrong. Which is it? Well, if the member doesn't understand what we're trying to do, let me make it uh, clear for her. What we're doing is repealing the long gun registry, which is comprised of data. That data will be destroyed in order to scrap the long gun registry. Reports from Durban are shocking. This government is missing in action, invisible, and our country, once prided as a global environmental leader, has been, quote, relegated to the margins of the Durban debate. One media commentator goes as far to say, quote, Canada's invisibility at the summit suggests that it's ashamed of their climate stand and their reputation is taking a beating. Why is this government failing our country and the world by abdicating global leadership on the world's most pressing environmental issue? Yeah. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of the Environment. Speaker, I'm not quite sure where the Liberal Party's concern for our environment was when they signed on to an international agreement that only included one third of the world's global emitters. Shame. Or, you know what, where they implemented policies that would detriment our economy through a massive carbon tax. Mr. Speaker, what is truly shameful is that the members' party opposite does not support a plan that looks at a sector by sector regulatory approach that will balance our environment with economic sustainability and our country's approach to saying, hey, everyone, we need an agreement with everyone around the table. Here, here. Uh, Mr. Speaker, that uh, parliamentary sector needs to brush up on her homework. Um, Lachine, declare. Order. Order. The Honourable Member for Vancouver Quadra has the floor. Order. We'll let the Member for Vancouver Quadra put her question. Monsieur le Président, Lachine declare être prête à aller encore plus loin dans ses engagements face à l'accord de Kyoto. Au même moment, le gouvernement canadien déclare qu'il laisse tomber son engagement dans cet accord, alors que la plupart des grandes puissances économiques s'engagent à développer ces économies vertes. Pourquoi les conservateurs se tournent-ils vers leur passé de réformiste, réformiste 
et refuse de servir les vrais intérêts économiques et environnementaux des Canadiens. Madame le secrétaire parlementaire. Well, Mr. Speaker, what's in the best interest of Canadians is an approach to and managing our environment that balances both economic sustainability right. and the environment. This is why we have an approach that looks at sector by sector regulatory emission to uh, sector by sector approach to regulate our emissions as well as promoting an agreement where all uh, international players are at the table. That's right. That's this fair. is what we stand for. This is what Canadians want. It's an action focused plan. Mr. Speaker, the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives has reached a, released a report. When it comes to retirement savings, they're saying baby boomers. The Honourable Member for Hamilton East, Stony Creek, has the floor now. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As I said before, the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives has released a report that says baby boomers are the lost generation. According to this report, one-third of these people will not have enough money to retire. The government's plan, a pooled registered pension plan, in which Canadians have to gamble on the market. They have to play market roulette. The report clearly shows the Conservative plan is failing Canadians in a pensions crisis. When will this government come, under, come to understand? It's not about banks, it's not about insurance companies, it's about retirement security for seniors. Yeah. <laughs> Minister State for Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and that's why we have been focused on retirement income adequacy for all Canadians, Mr. Speaker. It's not just about seniors that are in retirement now, but it's helping to Canadians to prepare for their retirement, Mr. Speaker. The opposition would suggest that we would double the Canada Pension Plan contribution. Mr. Speaker, our provincial counterparts do not think that's a good idea, even though the folks that like to tax and spend think that's a good idea. It would actually kill jobs in this country, Mr. Speaker. What we've done is working with our partners, the provinces. We've developed the pooled registered pension plan that has been applauded across this country, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for London Fanshawe. Mr. Speaker, the government is not listening. Rolling the dice with retirement savings doesn't create a secure retirement for Canadian seniors. Mr. Speaker, instead of letting seniors age with dignity, this government is allowing them to live in poverty. Too many seniors can't afford food, housing or medication. According to news reports, some are even relying on a private lottery to try to make ends meet. All seniors, all, deserve to live with dignity. Why is this government refusing to help? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Our government continues to take strong action to support seniors. Since 2006, our government has provided billions in annual tax relief for seniors and pensioners, removed hundreds of thousands of seniors from the tax rolls completely, introduced the largest GIS increase in a quarter century, and made significant investments in affordable housing for low-income seniors. If the opposition truly wanted to support seniors, they would have voted in support of these measures. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honorable Member for Brandon Suris. Mr. Speaker, Alan Oberg and his seven Canadian Wheat Board directors said they would spend millions of dollars of farmers' money to fight Bill C-18, the Marketing Freedom for Grain Mark Farmers Act, and they did. After spending millions of farmers' money on advertising misinformation, Mr. Oberg and the Board have filed a baseless court case to prevent Western Canadian grain farmers from exercising marketing freedom. Mr. Speaker, our government believes farmers should have the marketing freedom they want and deserve. Could the Minister of Agriculture please explain the implications of this court case? Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Well, Mr. Speaker, I thank my honourable colleague from Brandon Service for this great question. Our government categorically disagrees with this declaration, and on behalf of Western Canadian farmers, we will appeal this decision. This government will continue to deliver on our promise to give farmers the marketing freedom they want and deserve. Members on all sides of this House agree that Parliament has the right to introduce or amend legislation. This government remains committed to providing farmers with the options they need, marketing freedom including the choice to market through a voluntary Canadian Wheat Board. Mr. Speaker. Monsieur le Président, la situation en République démocratique du Congo est inquiétante et nous préoccupe. Et les résultats annoncés hier, les résultats partiels annoncés hier par la Commission électorale sont problématiques. Et c'est ça que la diaspora 
euh, congolaise critique, M. le Président. Et au lieu de critiquer cette diaspora, il faudrait peut-être tenter de répondre à leurs questions, à leurs préoccupations. Alors, ma question est très simple. Qu'est-ce que le gouvernement a l'intention de faire comme geste concret au, au delà d'un appel au calme, là, pour s'assurer que les résultats de l'élection au Congo sont le reflet réel de la volonté populaire des Congolais. Oui, bonne question. Alors, euh, secteur parlementaire du ministre des Affaires étrangères. Mr. Speaker, results are still in the process of being tabulated and released. We urge all signs to remain calm and let the democratic process unfold. Our hope is to see a result that was conducted in a free and fair manner for the people of the Democratic Republic of Congo. We also urge any protesters here in Canada to remain calm and peaceful. Disruptive behavior is unnecessary. The voices of those who are concerned about the legitimacy of the election are being heard. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Monsieur le Président, avec ce gouvernement, les dignitaires étrangers corrompus qui vivent au Canada peuvent dormir sur leurs deux oreilles. La loi qui permet de geler leurs, leurs actifs a été adoptée il y a neuf mois. Et pourtant, la communauté tunisienne attend encore de savoir si, oui ou non, les avoirs de la famille Ben Ali ont, sont, ont été gelés. Le gouvernement tunisien a demandé au Canada de geler ses actifs. Est-ce que le ministre peut nous dire ce que le gouvernement a fait pour respecter la demande de la Tunisie et la loi canadienne? Madame le secrétaire parlementaire. Mr. Speaker, our government has taken strong action and sanctions against the uh, uh, members of the former Ben Ali regime, and this matter is under review by our officials. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. For Sue St. Marie. Mr. Speaker, our government has acted to ensure the residents of Attawapiskat have access to safe and warm shelter for the coming months. We delivered urgent funding to renovate five houses and are working with Emergency Management Ontario and other partners to deliver necessities to the residents like composite toilets, wood stoves and building materials. Can the Minister please update the House on our efforts to assist the residents of Attawapiskat? Minister of Aboriginal Affairs. Mr. Speaker, our priority is and has always been the health and safety of the residents of Attawapiskat. Unlike the NDP, we are focusing on a plan, not on scoring political points. Our action plan to assist this community is already underway and permanent homes will be delivered as soon as possible. I've written to Chief Spence with immediate solutions that include transforming community buildings into comfortable living spaces so that people can use them as a temporary home. We are committed to the delivery of safe shelter and necessities to the community. I encourage the Chief and Council to work with our government. The Honourable Member for Newton North Delta. Mr. Speaker, it has been 26 years since the devastating Air India tragedy, and the victims' families are still waiting for justice and compensation from this Conservative government. Yet another hurdle is in their way. They must now provide more proof they were related to the victims. Mr. Speaker, is that a joke? What more can they do to show they were related? The families and the community just want this nightmare to end. Why is this government determined to extend this drama and humiliation? The Honourable Minister of Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, it's uh, very clear that the tragic Air India incident uh, is a reminder that Canada is not immune from uh, terrorist acts. In fact, our government responded very quickly uh, to years of neglect uh, in looking into the matter. We are following the Commissioner's recommendations and in respect of the extra payments, uh, we are taking appropriate steps to ensure that the recommendation is followed and to ensure that we administer taxpayers' money appropriately. Une à une, les raisons alléguées par les conservateurs pour discréditer le protocole de Kyoto se révèlent n'être que des parades pour masquer leurs déficiences climatiques. Maintenant que les pays en développement se disent prêts à respecter les objectifs contraignants, le ministre de l'Environnement, qui en faisait pourtant une condition primordiale, refuse net de s'engager en affirmant que cette décision idéologique est prise depuis longtemps. Pourquoi le gouvernement cherche-t-il encore une fois à torpiller les négociations environnementales, sinon pour protéger les grandes pétrolières et le bilan épouvantable du Canada, qui fait pire que la Russie, que l'Inde, que la Chine, que le Brésil? <rires> 
All right, but the Secretary put him on there. Well, I'm not sure what my colleague Ockfusset is referring to when he says we have an appalling record when the International Institute for Sustainable Development says, and I quote, Canada is moving in the right direction on greenhouse gas policy and is establishing the policy architecture to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Hmm. Mr. Speaker, we are taking a leadership role. It's time that the opposition party start acknowledging that and being proud of the role that our country has in the international community with environmental stewardship. Here, here. That concludes question period for today. The chair has